doing tonight? Good, welcome to Pachaka Cha Volume 12. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a very fun and exciting night ahead of us. And my name is Sarah. I will be the MC for tonight. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Pachaka Cha, it is a format that was derived from two men um, from Klein Ditham Architecture. And they came up with this format because they said that architects' presentations took too long. So the format is 20 images, and each image is only up for 20 seconds. Um, so that kind of keeps the presenter concise and to the point on their presentation. So tonight we have seven wonderful presenters who I would like to introduce if you would like to stand up. First of all, we have Louis Berg. <laughs> We have David Hartkop, who is also our production guy in the back. Tom Ladka. Sally Lincoln. Dr. Charlie Val. Janet Wilson. And Susan Wolf. Okay, and just a quick look about how the night is going to go. We'll have our first four presenters come up, and after they are all done, we'll have some time for some questions and answers, and then we'll have a 15-minute intermission, um, and you can go out and get some more food and some drinks, and then we'll come back in and finish off with our last three presenters and some more time for questions. So we will go ahead and get started with our first presenter. Can you hear me okay? I think I'm going to have to carry it around with me. You're going to take off? Okay. There you go. Right up to the mouth. Okay. Cool. Hit it, Sarah. Okay, so this Pachacucha is about uh, a little community library I started at the corner of Quincy and Evans. I moved into the neighborhood about three years ago, so I'm going to go through. Uh, you can see a photograph of what it looked like. Um, couple of years ago, and uh, the origins of the concept, my first try, and the critical events. Um, I saw something like this for two seconds on a YouTube video that was about something else, and I said, I'm going to do one of those. I, I, I got to do that. And so I found an abandoned cabinet in my basement, and my friend Donna, who's here in the second row, had a window in her backyard that was kind of decaying that exactly fit uh, the opening. So uh, I set it up, attached it to a gazebo I had in the yard, and uh, I, I had thought I'd use my recycled, I read a lot. So uh, uh, I put my magazines out, nobody was interested in my weird cast off <laughs> periodicals, and people uh, weren't sure it was okay to touch things. You can see it's, it's not uh, very, very clear here, but you can, you can see the cabinet was kind of concealed, and I didn't really have much of a sign on it. So mostly people thought, well, it's on private property, and I wonder what it is, but they were too shy to touch it until I went up and said, it's okay. So um, I decided I had to get a little more public. And then a storm came and blew the gazebo away, and I had to start all over. So I found a, I had, a, had, a, had uh, someone living nearby who liked to dig holes. So we put a hole in and set the post in concrete. And I gave up on the magazines and started putting books in it. And I uh, was inspired to put in kids' books, because there are lots of, uh, lots of parents around. And I also put a sign on it. Uh, saying what it was and that it was fine to take books and I um, had a, a sudden blazing inspiration and made a Facebook page for it. <laughs> Um, and once I did that, people really started to feel more comfortable. I mean, things were coming and going, but it was pretty slow. <laughs> so here it is, Quincy and Evans Community Reads. You're welcome to join it to see what's going on. I don't, I don't upload every day, but if somebody drops off a new load of interesting books, I take a picture and put it up there. And, um, you know, if there's news about the Xeriscape Garden uh, Exchange in the spring or the Seed Exchange, um, I'll put that up there too. Um, I've been really pleased with the kids book section because it's something that lower income mothers really would like to get more books for their kids. And I mean, they take them and return them. And every, every well, they say every dollar spent on early childhood education pays off more than any other kind of government spending. So, and we're not even spending the dollar. So this is what books look like to me, of course. You know, I've got my playaways from the library, and I've got my books on my phone, and I've got my books on my iPad. But I still love handling a hard copy book. I still like getting one from a friend. 
different. And in a way, I think it makes them more special. So uh, that's it about books for the moment. I also um, collected seeds from uh, local hardy plants that do well without water, for example, and put them up. And, and that, that did a pretty good trade, too. And be, people bought out, brought out stuff from their basement collections, you know, the half <laughs> bags of seeds and things. And then uh, I found a figurine on the sidewalk. And uh, a plumber <laughs> who works for me said, hey, put it in the cabinet. And it was a brilliant idea. So these duckies showed up. And I thought, well, that's really great. And then toys started coming and going. They'd just show up in the bottom of the cabinet. And people would drop stuff off. And so I built a toy cabinet at kid height <laughs> underneath. Um, and that's designed with a piece of plexiglass so kids can just lift it up and they don't have to worry about closing it, but they can still see what's inside. And you can see down at the lower left here, uh, it got pretty well filled up with toys over the summer. It's pretty empty right now, but here were some of the displays of stuff that turned up. Um, and occasionally, you know, somebody would dro somebody dropped off uh, Hot Wheels in their original packages. I mean, there was funny stuff going. Those went real quick. Um, but anyway, uh, it's it's you know, I think it's a great thing, really. Um, for kids to get the idea that there's something special out there for them, for adults to get the idea that there's something special out there for them, um, that there's something out there that they can participate in, and people, you know, it's it's not a it's it's sort of unmonitored. Um, and these are, I, I discovered this was part of a whole huge movement. These are little free libraries that are all over the United States. Um, but anyway, I thought, hey, let's, let's go for it. People would say, oh, it'll probably get vandalized. And I'm like, well, the worst thing that happened was that it blew away. I can, you know, it's, it's, it's OK. And in fact, it's been fine. I took this picture because this, I thought, was one of the most creative ones. This one's in New York City. But people can actually get underneath it and kind of look around in, in a sort of semi-private environment. I thought that was cool. And I like living in a city, so I wanted to put that up. I think it's a really great thing to have a high population density for the exchange of ideas. I'm really into the idea that rich communities have nothing to do with people who have lots of money. You can make a rich community very easily, and there's nothing wrong with it. I, I don't know why people are afraid. They say, well, one person can mess it all up. Well, that's only if you let them, you know. It can be really great. So I'd like to indulge the idea of community deliciousness, that the local is what's beautiful. Um, you know, you don't go to another town to go to their McDonald's, you go to see what's really there. And that's kind of how I feel about Pueblo. I know that's kind of a minority opinion for most of us, but I think it's really cool. This was an idea I had this spring, and I, I asked Zeriscape gardeners who are always thinning their most successful plants and who hate to throw them away to put them in my yard, which was a dust pit, and I refused to water it. So now uh, a lot of people in the neighborhood have wonderful Zeric plants that have been developed for decades. And my last slide is a real one. You're going to have to do without the microphone here. I found a door for a new library. If anybody's interested, it's right here. Yeah. So talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ready? Um, hi. So tonight I am here to talk about improvised music, or free improvisation as it's also called. Um, I myself am a musician, I play the cello, and I'm classically trained, but for about the last um, 15 years or so, I've played uh, pretty much exclusively um, improvised music. So what does it mean to improvise? What does it mean to improvise with music? It means to create, to invent, um, to compose on the spot. And um, I would venture to say that um, each one of you have done this at some point. Uh, if it's singing in the shower, or it might be humming a tune, um, making up a melody that you couldn't quite remember. But we've, we, we all improvise. And um, that's the way music started. Of course, it wasn't um, begun as a written form. It was, uh, it, was, it was improvised. And even when 
classical music started to become written down um, for, for centuries, uh, there was a lot of room for improvisation. And actually, musicians were expected to improvise. They were expected to uh, embellish the scores that, that they would play. But at some point, this became um, out of fashion. And all of a sudden, uh, musicians were, were forced to play what was on the page, no more. And it was taking the, keep, you know, keep the composing to the composers, which as a musician, I find incredibly boring. Um, so improvisation as a genre, as a music style, where does that come from? Well, it really largely comes out of jazz. Jazz is uh, inherently improvisational. And um, somewhere uh, mid uh, 20th century, the improvisational style of jazz started getting further and further out there. Musicians started really leaving behind the, the, the melodies, the, the jazz riffs, and started creating new music, new compositions. Uh, another influence on current um, improvisation is contemporary classical music. Um, 20th century classical music, this is a photo of uh, John Cage and David Tudor, um, introduced a couple really important things to um, improvise music. One is the notion of, of different instrumentation. Um, John Cage would um, use prepared pianos, which have all kinds of stuff stuck in the strings. And um, another thing that he introduced was the notion of indeterminacy. So it was giving the musicians some control back. So although you were pay playing a score, there was a lot of room to create. And so there's a lot of chance. So the composition would sound completely different every single time that it was performed. So when people improvise, what they are not doing is this. They're not playing notes on a page. They're not playing according to a time signature or um, a melody or harmonic structure. They're leaving all this stuff behind. Well, then what do they do? So um, what they uh, will do is take whatever is at hand that might be a cello or a chainsaw or some electronics or a toy piano, and they use these instruments as tools to interact with each other and to create compositions uh, on the spot. And if you're not used to listening to this kind of music, uh, it can be a little disturbing, or at the very least confusing. When you take away those structures that we have uh, learned you know, as a young child and how to listen to music, uh, it can be very difficult to make sense of it. But I'm here to tell you that there is hope. Um, you can retrain your ear in listening to music and sound in a different way. I did this myself in college. I uh, was very confused by this, this improvised music style, this completely free improvisation. But I, I was patient, and I did a lot of really careful listening. And what I discovered is that I could hear things like color. And, and texture. And it really, it not only changed the way that I play and listen to music, but it really opened up a completely new way of listening to the world and um, interacting every day with sound. And um, one of the things that's great is that um, learning to listen differently, sounds that were an annoyance can become really, really fascinating. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, we were renovating the, the second floor of this library uh, earlier this year, and I was working on the first floor, and there was sanding. And um, most amazing sound was coming through from these guys sanding the floor, and I thought, it's like a concert. I'm at work, and I hear a concert. Well, my other uh, coworkers didn't quite agree with me on this, but, um, but really, I mean, it, it can be, um, it can really open up your, your ear to a lot of very new uh, experiences. So my advice to you, if you're at all interested in this, is um, to approach improvised music, I find it really helpful to listen or to think of it as a conversation between the musicians. It gives it a little bit of structure, and uh, yeah. when you listen carefully, you can really hear the pullback or I would say even sometimes disagreements among the musicians, which is very interesting. Here is a picture of the ensemble I'm in, a PICO, the Pueblo Improvisers Community Orchestra. Uh, we also have dance and we get together and we improvise. We have some traditional instruments and some uh, not so traditional instruments. And we also sometimes do play scores. Um, but you'll notice there aren't notes 
on the page, but these are scores by Bob Marsh. This is window, um, door, and um, it's just a wonderful composition that I worked on uh, over the summer. And uh, we also uh, play out a lot of times on First Fridays. This is a picture of a recent performance with the, uh, a member of the Hand Weavers Guild on Loom. It was so much fun. And um, so if you're at all interested, check us out. We have a Facebook page. Um, we, again, we usually play on First Fridays. And uh, if you come out, definitely uh, let me know what you think. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't need to stand. Well, working for the library has gotten me interested in, in a subject that I never really thought about before, uh, also working with computers, and that is preservation of digital information. Basically, we want digital information to last and stay accessible. And it's really funny how quickly this stuff is going to disappear. We may not even realize it, how much of our information is digital. In 86, less than 1% was digital, and uh, the rest was on paper or on records or tape, et cetera. There was a turning point in 2002 where the estimates were 50%, and now, if you look all the way at the top, of the total amount of information, over 99% is digital. You can see the big, uh, big data, that's a G in the bottom of D. Big data is information coming out of super colliders and weather uh, weather simulation systems, mostly giant amounts of information that really don't concern you and I. But the rest at the bottom do, newspapers, things like that. These are really our options of storing information. We've got stone tablets, they last a long time. We don't really use them that much anymore. And then I'll kind of skip down to the, the extreme other side. Hard disks, which are used uh, in all of our data centers and are really state of the art. I wanted to make a comparison of these things and try to find the optimal way to store digital information. So here's a chart. I don't know if this is going to go over well. This might be a little dry, but actually it's very fascinating. This is, this is I, I love this kind of stuff. Uh, you've got all the information there and then qualities I like. So what's expandable? Well, they're all expandable. You just get more of them. You know, you, you want to expand your collection of information that's stored on tablets. You get more, you know, more tablets, presumably pyramids or caves to store them in, um, all the way down to hard disks, you get a bigger and bigger data center. The, uh, the next thing to look at, though, is cost of storing huge amounts of information. Well, tablets, I mean, we're talking about quarries here to, uh, to be able to contain even one day's worth of Facebook information. Uh, so you, you kind of cross that off. And IC chips, as they stand, are really for temporary small memory. It's getting better, though. I would almost hesitate to have an X there. We'll look at e-access. So how easy is it to put this information on the internet? Stone tablets, not so much. You'd have to scan it and have it on a hard drive or have it on a tape. But intrinsically, pretty much the top half are just analog, real artifacts. And the bottom ones you could, you could scan. Then technologically neutral, so meaning uh, you can read it with technology that doesn't change, or it'll stay readable. The machine that reads it won't go away. The information won't be lost. Well, the first three are pretty neutral. You can read it with your own eyes. You don't need a machine, but the bottom ones aren't. Human readable, pretty much the same, the same deal. The ones that are not tech neutral tend to be not human readable. And I thought that was kind of an interesting little uh, halfway discovery. If you can read it with your own eyes, you don't need a special machine to read it. So, And then longevity. Well, there's sort of this plot. And I guess if you're going to play a game, which one is suitable, you look across and try to figure out which one has all green check marks. Uh, yeah, and I did that. So uh, here you go. Here's the results of this test uh, coming right up. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? Not, not one of these actually fits the bill for real digital storage. In fact, the only way that they do it now is you put it on a hard drive which wears out and they have to copy the information to a new hard drive every time it happens. And that's, that's really what happens. And uh, you can make perfect digital copies, but sooner or later there will be so much digital information that people won't copy all of it. Uh, and kind of what I realized here is electronic accessibility seems to preclude 
uh, technological neutrality. That, that means if you can put it on the internet intrinsically, it's really not tech neutral. So it seems like you're stuck right there. Uh, but let's make a leap of creativity and just assume that we've got a solution. See, I made green arrows. We did it. Now it's just a, now it's just a uh, mystery solving to figure out how we did it. Um, it seems to be that the only th way that something can be tech neutral and human readable is if it's its own machine. And the only type of media that could be its own machine is not a tape, but it's a microchip, because that is a complete mach machine in a place. Here's a microchip that is readable, just like a stone tablet. It has a tiny video projector right on the chip, so you could hold this next to your eyeball, and you can read information that's on it. I, it's made up. Uh, it's made up right now. But, and then the technologically neutral part is we have, other, we have other things like, how do you connect power? Well, it's solar powered. How do you connect the data? Well, near field RF. It's, it communicates without having to connect wires to it. So you will always have a digital radio of some kind. Um, here is kind of a model of the chip. It's a little thing in a glass capsule. It's a really uh, hot new field in semiconductors trying to put a lot of different technologies on the same chip. It used to be you would have photovoltaics or one kind, processors are another kind, memory is another kind. Well, now you can kind of put them all on one chip, so maybe for the first time you could build something like this. They can talk to each other. You just put them in a pile. You don't have to hook them together. There are no contacts to go bad. You just put them in a pile and shine light at them. And they'll compare and contrast the information that's on them to make sure that there's at least two or three copies. Whatever the RAID setting is, you could have a huge pile of them, for instance, in the basement of the library. And you just have Maybe I just I picture a giant fishbowl with a fluorescent tube stuck down in the middle, feeding them all light, and then a little router next to it. It'd make it interesting, kind of like Star Trek or something. Is but radio, radio frequency. And then you actually can network them, because uh, if it's connected to a normal server, the server stuff can all be changed out over time, give and take with the fads. Or if civilization falls, you've still got piles of chips that you can have out in the sun and you can hold up and you could relearn how to read, you know? Uh, so thank you. There's some ideas. <laughs> this slideshow is sponsored by Healthcare for All Colorado. The goal is to explain single-payer health care and how it will help you and your family. Every person deserves physical and mental care. Health care is a human right. A social service issued according to medical need, not a product sold according to who can afford it, and not a business. Most Americans believe everyone should have access to good care without financial hardship. The U.S. is the only developed country that doesn't provide comprehensive health care to all of its citizens. 30 million of us are uninsured, many are underinsured, and 45,000 die every year from lack of coverage. Markets are not a good way to distribute health care. U.S. public spending per capita for health care exceeds total spending in other nations. Public spending includes subsidies for private care, government employees, Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA. The U.S. is number one in the world. At least that's what we believe. Among developed countries, unfortunately, we are number one in infant mortality, maternal mortality, and 45,000 die from lack of health insurance coverage. We're not number one in health care. We're also not number one in life expectancy. If you look at the graph, you can see that people in Germany, Canada, and the UK live about two years longer than we do. In Sweden, France, and Italy, they live four years longer. I'd like four more years, wouldn't you? In addition, two million Americans are involved in medical bankruptcies. Guess what? Zero in Canada, where there is universal health care coverage. And the same is true in all developed countries. In fact, they don't understand the concept of medical bankruptcies. And it wasn't that they were irresponsible. 
78% of those medically bankrupt had insurance. 60% had private insurance. 17% had VA, military, Medicare, or Medicaid. The main cost for health care is the health care insurance industry. They exist for profit, they operate for profit, answer to shareholders, not patients. In fact, that's why they dictate your care by denying claims or certain prescription drugs. In 1970, the U.S. population was about 200 million. Look at the yellow area where it shows the low growth in the number of doctors to take care of more of us now, 44 years later. But look at the dramatic increase in the number of staff needed to communicate with the insurance industry. Now that there are 300 million of us with fewer doctors per capita to care for us, we are wasting 31% of our health care dollars on paperwork for the insurance industry's profits. Only 3% of our health care dollar is spent on Medicare paperwork. The Affordable Care Act has good elements. Unfortunately, it subsidizes private insurance with no regulation of premiums, deductibles, or co-pays, virtually no measures to reduce costs, 30 million remain uninsured, and many governors refused free Medicaid expansion. Single-payer national insurance, national health care, is a system in which a single public agency, not insurance companies, pays for all medically necessary health care costs. Delivery of care would remain largely private. You would regain free choice of doctor and hospital. Single payer is not socialized medicine. Your doctors will remain in private care. Your doctors and other health insurance providers, health care providers, excuse me, will not be employees of the government. Your hospital will remain under private ownership and you'll have free choice of doctor and hospital. Some benefits are comprehensive coverage for all medically necessary services, including doctor, hospital, long-term care, mental health, vision, dental, and prescription drugs. No out-of-pocket costs. Insurance companies will no longer dictate your health care decisions. With single payer, there will be $326 billion in new costs but $569 billion in savings. The net savings is $243 billion. Single payer covers everyone with better benefits and spends less. Single payer improves Medicare with comprehensive benefits, no financial barriers, no supplemental plans, and preserves private delivery. It expands Medicare by covering all Americans, including Congress. <laughs> Everybody in, nobody out. If you make under $500,000 a year, you're going to save money on your health care. You win. Even if you're earning more than half a million dollars a year, you're only going to pay slightly more for your health care, with no premiums, co-pays, or deductibles. The funding from Medicare, Medicaid, payroll tax, and income tax goes into one single-payer health care fund, which pays for your dentist, hospital, mental health or long-term facility, doctor, prescription drugs, vision care, and emergency services. So how do you get single-payer? Join Health Care for All Colorado. Support H.R. 676 and Senate Bill 1782. Learn more about single payer at pnhp.org and share your knowledge with family, friends, and others. Thank you. Hi. Has Pueblo or any other city of the world solved the graffiti problem? The answer is no. Could promoting Pueblo as the mural capital of the world and improve our economy also solve the graffiti problem? The answer is yes. Graffiti continues today as an unsolvable problem. Even the Sphinx in Egypt has been tagged, and for as long as people have been able to write, they've been writing on walls. 
There's a huge public cost associated with this graffiti. An estimated 12 billion a year is spent cleaning up graffiti in the United States. No one has solved this problem. So let's approach it different. They say the sign of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Perhaps a success here would be a template for other cities. There's been an effort to make Pueblo a destination city, and here's the plan to do it through art. The idea is simple. Paint murals all over the city. The city hires three artists who work eight hours a day and pay them from the funds used for graffiti abatement to paint murals on city-owned and private sanctioned walls on top of the existing graffiti. It's important to differentiate between graffiti artists who paint on sanctioned walls, the muralists, <clears throat> and those delinquents who paint their initials and gang marks on private property and public byways, the taggers. When muralists paint over the graffiti, there are two reasons these areas are not tagged again. One, the taggers want their tags to stand out and on a multicolored background, it doesn't. The other is, there's an unwritten code of respect for the murals. Murals cre create beauty through creativity, while tiger tigers create blight. Tigers would be encouraged to come out of the shadows and work to become respected muralists. This transition will reduce the number of taggers, reduce the costs associated with cleanup, and reduce the number of places available for tigers. We could change the face of Pueblo, redirecting efforts from cleanup to creation. So, how do we pay for these murals? Grants, donations, court fines. And by using the existing funds designated for graffiti removal, a city our size spends about $100,000 per year on graffiti abatement. And they are marking walls with mismatched paint, blotches of grays over tans over white, and make up the majority of graffiti removal attempts, thus creating another type of blight. These walls make great surfaces to tag again because they are of a neutral color and tags will stand out. In an effort to be competitive and to distinguish ourselves from other cities, we could showcase our unique qualities. Public art plays a significant role in this process. It demonstrates to residents and tourists our artistic expression, diversity, and the creative impulse of our community. The Pueblo Levy Project is such an expression it's important to recognize this landmark as a valuable asset and build upon that reputation. The largest mural in the world, as designated by the Guinness Book of World Record, is in our backyard. Tourist information signs along I-25 and Highway 50 declaring us as mural capital of the world could be the catalyst needed to encourage travelers to stop, take a look around, and appreciate the beauty we already know. Maps of prime mural locations would be distributed for visitors. The mural theme would be echoed in tourism, advertising, and PEDCO marketing programs. The artists would create themes as designated from an arts committee, like water or landscapes. The paint can come from the city's recycled paint pickups. The artists will paint, teach, monitor students, and mentor court-appointed delinquents. They will coordinate students from establishments like the public and private schools, Boys and Girls Club, the Art Center, and the University. We have in our community many muralists using officially approved walls for their art. Their problem is wall space, as they only paint with permission. Give them walls and let them paint over the graffiti every day. Guest artists from other cities could add a celebrity factor. Pueblo has an international reputation for murals. Consequently, many artists want to come here and paint. It goes as far as mural workshops marketed regionally, which would provide additional revenue to sustain the program. Create a graffiti hotline. The sooner polluted walls are addressed, the better. The three artists will keep track of the gang signs and notify the police. Reward the muralists with money and publicity. Penalize the delinquents by not giving them publicity. Never show photos of tagging in the media and by giving them a choice at the time of sentencing. Pay a fine or work it off. By apprenticing with a muralist, they would be learning to paint from artists they respect and creating art by understanding the craft of how a mural is made. Traditionally, cities value public art and architecture by investing large sums of money, ensuring beauty for their cities. Incidentally, these are the very qualities that attract new businesses. 
Pueblo has focused on this theme by investing in our city with the harp, the Rawlings Library, the El Pueblo Museum, the Sound Barrier Wall. The murals will complement these projects. We also have dozens of fountains, as we want the world to know the city of Pueblo has water for future growth. Pueblo, Colorado, mural capital of the world. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'm Charlie Vile. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work at Parkview Medical Center. And um, I'll be presenting on post-traumatic stress disorder tonight. Uh, I uh, work both on the chemical dependency unit and the inpatient rehab unit. So I get to see lots and lots of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I'm kind of dovetailing with the All Pueblo Reads and the book is on Hemingway. Hemingway was hit by a mortar round in World War II and World War I and he also drove an ambulance in that war, covered the Spanish Civil War, war as a reporter and other conflicts. Um, tonight I'm gonna cover all these areas about PTSD and all in six minutes. <laughs> Not sure how I'm gonna do that. Um, to diagnose PT, oh, that's what I'm covering. Got to catch up here. To diagnose PTSD, there must be an exposure to a traumatic event, and then memories that force their way into the person's consciousness. Avoidance of memories is a primary symptom of PTSD. It really can't develop unless the person avoids the memories. I'm going to talk mostly about PTSD with military personnel because we see lots of them in our chemical dependency unit, but these five disorders are usually seen together. I've sort of coined the term the warrior cluster, um, but you, see, you also see this uh, cluster of disorders in civilians. Um, PTSD does not always develop after a trauma, and why it does or doesn't is kind of a puzzle to us. Lots of research on that. Uh, the incidence is probably much higher than is reported. Okay, now we're going to look at how PTSD develops. When an extremely traumatic event occurs, people try to avoid the memories, but the brain's way of resolving uncomfortable memories is to review them over and over many times until they become boring. If the event is disturbing enough, the person continues to avoid memory of it. Um, so the brain creates nightmares. And with each nightmare or memory, you get a little spurt of adrenaline. Imagine trying to sleep with a lot of adrenaline. Doesn't work too well. Because of uh, the adrenaline we, can't, adrenaline, we can't sleep. We're anxious. Um, and irritable, depression, panic attacks are more likely, and people often begin to use uh, alcohol or drugs to self-medicate. Uh, there are three main treatments for PTSD that have been shown to be effective. Um, all uh, Exposure therapy is one, EMDR is another, and various cognitive behavior therapies, including cognitive processing therapy, which is what the military uses itself most. All three therapies involve getting the person to recall and talk about the memory that they don't want to recall. This is called exposure. It's also helpful to learn to think differently about the memory, uh, maybe without self-blame. Exposure therapy is really difficult for patients um, extreme anxiety is very uncomfortable and symptoms often increase before they decrease. Sorry about that. Uh, I like to kind of dink with things like treatment and see if I can make it work better. So I've developed a way to make exposure therapy more comfortable. I use deep relaxation after people talk about the memory and I also have people exercise. Often my sessions are in a gym right on, on our campus. Cognitive restructuring or thought rebuilding also helps 
uh, make the memories more bearable, but the thoughts have to be true as well as more helpful. Along with treating memories, we have to change behavior. Most PTSD victims are constantly looking for danger and they avoid reminders of the event, which we call triggers. In therapy, we get them not to constantly scan the environment and to tolerate triggers without high anxiety. Oops, I think I, forgot, I messed up on that. My soldiers are usually trying to avoid crowds, um, but car accident victims are avoiding different triggers and rape victims have their own set of triggers. Um, I usually have limited time to work with people anywhere from one to three weeks and PTSD is not often cured. So what we do is focus on uh, managing it better, making it less uncomfortable. It's important to teach people how to continue to decrease symptoms after they leave the therapy. So I get people to do self-exposure. Uh, so what we do in therapy in our treatment center, they learn to do at home in their own environment. My military people want to function normally, just like we all do. And this means tolerating crowds, being able to go to Walmart or a movie, uh, being in places with strangers and not thinking that other people are out to kill you. And that's actually what they think a lot of times. Um, if a person is self-medicating, it's necessary to get off the alcohol or street drugs before treatment for PTSD. In Hemingway's time, there was no treatment for PTSD. It was then called shell shock. Uh, and he used alcohol to manage the PTSD with very limited results. Thank you. I might have been touching that. That's okay. Okay, I'll talk through it. It had some music, some neat music, but basically we had a house donated in June uh, 2012, and we thought, well, let's make a community house. It was um, donated by... Uh, Mark Carlos, and uh, we thought we could add something, and it was because a guy saw me sitting on a corner in a huge RV for the billboard for a social injustice movement, and he asked what I did, so he brought me to his neighborhood to show me all the boarded up houses, and I said, yeah, that is a shame, and he said, you know, if we could work on these houses, we can do some great things on the east side, and, and I thought, that's exactly what we could do. So we got a grant from New York, they gave us $5,000, which I thought it was going to cover a roof in the inside, and then I found out we had no plumbing or electrical. <laughs> I didn't know you could get a house that didn't have electrical or plumbing. Apparently you can. So I had four walls to work with. But we had um, a lot of eager people and, and a lot of people willing to help and volunteer. So we took this, which you can see it was quit, and PCC came through and they helped. Ken Shore uh, brought out his interns and did the electrical, and we had over 50 volunteers help bring this house to a little community house. The chieftain covered the story a few times for us and we had a surplus of, of people that were volunteering to bring this together. So we, uh, oh yeah, and Dr. Ann Courtright and I made a sombrero for the RV and put it in the Fiesta Parade and we were, we were having a little fun in her garage late one night. But uh, that's our filing system in the RV. Before we had the house, we just had the RV parked in the back and we were working out of it. But since then, we've had another house donated uh, that we're making a music and art house. It's pretty much in the same shape, maybe not as bad, but it has no electrical or plumbing and so we're working hard. But we have had events in the yard. The kids have put, they've made buttons, they've made signs, they've been painting. And we're really excited that the neighborhood has embraced us the way they have. So that's our little stone house, and that's going to be a music and art house if we can make that happen. Well, I shouldn't say we, if we are going to make it happen. Um, so we put signs out, and we try to get volunteers. Pueblo Electrics did some uh, uh, donations with the electrical box. 
and we've had a few trades come forward. We had, that's our garden. We put a garden in the first year. We had ducks, we put tires around. Kayla was a rescue dog. We now have a rescue cat and uh, we have a boat. We had a shell of a boat which we made into a pirate ship. The kids thought that was really cute. So we just dragged, drug it out in front. But the kids then put it in the garden this year uh, Home Depot donated the soil and the kids planted and we didn't really know what was going to grow. We just said, here are some seeds. <laughs> so there was no planting involved. The kids just <laughs> threw them in and so we had pumpkins, we had squash and pumpkins and tomatoes in there and it was just a joy to watch grow. And I couldn't tell what a weed was and what the plant was so I had to let things grow on it before I could tell. But you know, we're getting them involved. We're getting them to think about food and where it comes from and healthy eating. Too many kids are going over to the dollar store and, and buying junk food and spending their time in front of a TV on Saturday. So we're trying to teach them that there are other things. And we've had some excellent music concerts with local artists, PCC coming out. Now we have a possible third house, okay? If you think I'm crazy with two, this just <laughs> reaffirmed that. Because the city came to me and said, we love what you're doing, we think you should take this house. It's the longest boarded up house in Pueblo. It's been boarded up for over six years. And I looked at it and I thought, I'm fearless and I'm frightened of this thing. <laughs> so we, we thought, but then we thought, well, they're all in a row. We had, this would be 812, 816, and 824 on East 5th Street. So we're going, find your passion on 5th Street. <laughs> So we're going to make a media house out of that third house. We're going to put a recording studio in for the kids. And we're going to, so there's our three houses. This is now the community house all done. There's the scary one. And there's, the, and we're going to have a haunted house for Halloween, by the way. And it's not a big stretch. We're just going to add a few more cobwebs. <laughs> so we thought, and, and we had 15 pumpkins donated. Well, they were kind of donated. I actually begged for them as we left the HRC meeting the other mor morning. And I'm like, what are you doing with all your pumpkins? Can we have them? And they loaded up a cart and put them out in the, in the car for me. So our mission is to empower people on the east side. I love the east side. I know a lot of people are scared and it's high crime. I got to tell you, I love the people. They're good working people. The kids are absolutely wonderful. We put on concerts where the kids got up and just ad-libbed a song and brought us all to tears because one little guy lost his grandma and he sang a song and we were all like, whoa. I mean, it was amazing. There's a lot of talent and I think if kids have a way to express themselves through music and through art and through all the feel-good things. This is Noemi, she's a board, on the board of directors, she's a local artist. She did this great big canvas and we went in the Cinco de Mayo parade and we covered up, you know, all the stuff that <laughs> may be a little offensive to some. But she's a great artist and a real inspiration to the kids because she just will, kids will come over and we'll just throw out crayons or fabric crayons. We have our own t-shirts. And so we get them in black and white and we let the kids paint them. And so at some point we'll probably get donations for the shirts. But um, we need volunteers. We have one house done. We're starting the other one. I have a guy who's a handy guy who's going to help with the electrical and the plumbing. Um, but we're going to make this happen on Fifth Street. So thank you.